Ruth University in Göttingen. Uh, he was a postdoctoral fellow at the Dunders Institute for Brain Cognition and Behavior in the Netherlands. Already you can see the direction in which he is moving, at which time, at the completion of which, he went to the Robarts Research Institute, a very well-known multi-approach imaging institute, not just on the neuro end, but on all domains, uh, in uh, Ontario, Canada. At the end of that time, he became an assistant professor at York University in the Department of Biology, moved up the ranks to associate member of uh, biology, and we were fortunate in 2017 that he moved to Vanderbilt in the Department of Psychology. Uh, he is currently Associate Professor of Psychology, Computer Science, and Biomedical Engineering, giving you a flavor of his interests and approach, uh, which you will hear about in due time. Uh, Dr. Bommelsdorf is known for a variety of things in addition to research. Number one, he is a dedicated uh, teacher and, and a very effective one, having received the Outstanding Teacher of the Year Award from the Neuroscience Graduate Program. Um, he has been the recipient of many honors, including the EWR Stacy Memorial Fellowship from the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada and the prestigious Petro Canada Young Innovator Award. He has been very, very productive. Just go look at 2020 when there are papers in Neuron, in Nature Communication, in PNAS. There are papers all popping up and they're really, really uh, good papers. His interests, primary interests are in computational approaches, but to attention. So give your undivided attention to Dr. Wommelsdorf. Um, thank you very much, uh, Ariel, for, for uh, this flattering and nice um, introduction and for uh, allowing me to speak here today. Um, uh, I, uh, I hope that uh, um, those who have questions can just add something in the chat so that we maybe in between take a break or at the end uh, have a bit more discussion about what I'm, uh, what, what I'm trying to convey. So the title of the talk is quite complex, but uh, breaking it down shows that I'm interested in understanding what makes um, our cognition flexible. And to achieve um, an understanding, um, I identify that we need uh, explicit computational modeling of behavior. We need to really know the cells, uh, the interneuron um, specific uh, processes and circuit motifs that underlie this uh, flexible uh, processing in the brain. And we need to understand the network level signature um, of uh, cognitive flexibility to have say, like a comprehensive um, overview of um, how cognitive flexibility is really achieved. Now, there are three, these are already three different levels that are similar to those three uh, identified by Mar in the, in the 70s as really being separate levels of understanding that should not be confused in individual studies. So there is a computational level, a representational level, and an implementational level. And I'm going through these levels, uh, uh, primarily focusing on um, how neuronal synchronization and flexible learning of attention sets um, are realized uh, to, under, to achieve uh, cognitive flexibility. Uh, as a precursor, so these are really three different chapters of today's talk. Um, uh, I want to summarize briefly what they are about. At the computational level of understanding cognitive flexibility, we need to find some models that actually realize flexible ad uh, adjustment of behavior when uh, our environmental demands change. We use reinforcement learning modeling uh, to achieve this uh, very effectively. Uh, how then uh, um, variables uh, are represented uh, that are needed to achieve flexible behavior um, is a question, uh, it's a representational question, and we identify a distributed uh, uh, signal in the firing rates and in the oscillatory activities in many different brain areas in the frontostriatal circuit. And finally, at the implementation level, we are really reaching the neuroscience uh, part. 
and um, the molecular and cellular level, where we identify what is the actual um, hardware that realizes this. So what are the oscillatory circuit motifs? What are the cell types? Now to, answer, to, to address all these questions, let's first start with a simple um, task that is very similar to our everyday behavior when we adjust to a new environment that we enter. In our experiments, monkeys are faced with different objects. Here you see a green and a yellow, a green and a red uh, um, oriented grating stimulus on the screen of a monitor. The monkey fixates in the center and does not move the eyes anymore during the trial until the very end. So during, during fixation, so while there is no movement of the animal whatsoever, there's only a covert deployment of attention to one of these two stimuli. Uh, um, and this covert attention should be to the stimulus that is currently or momentarily the relevant stimulus. And we don't say that to the animal which is a, a relevant stimulus, he has to find it out himself. So he is uh, constantly um, in a situation where he needs to find out what is most valuable to attend. We call this the feature selection period of our task and all the uh, results that I present today is about this kind of internal um, neuronal um, representation of what should I attend. Now you see already that these simple stimuli, experimental stimuli have multiple dimensions. They have a specific color, they are oriented differently um, and there are different locations. Uh, so, and they move also in different directions. Um, up and downwards. Um, so there are multiple features of these uh, objects that could be linked to reward, could be making a stimulus more valuable. And that is what we um, then, uh, then vary over blocks of trials. You see it at the bottom right here, that uh, in a reversal learning task that I focus on today, a red stimulus is maybe rewarded in the first 30 trials and then uh, is uh, not rewarded anymore. And the uh, previously not rewarded green stimulus becomes, uh, is, is rewarded, rewarded then in the new trial. So there's a constant reversal of reward contingencies. Now, the monkeys perform these tasks in order to receive reward or some yeah, juice uh, or water droplets uh, later on. And um, we, um, they are able to obtain the reward if they detect a very subtle change of the stimulus, a, um, a luminance change um, of the stimulus that is linked to reward. Yeah, in this case, he uh, makes an upward saccade direction, uh, an upward uh, um, saccadic eye movement when the uh, object moves in the counterclockwise direction, where a clockwise directional um, uh, 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 brief change uh, which should trigger a downward saccade. So we are probing for behavior at the end of the trial independent of this internal attentional state. Now we are doing these tasks uh, um, in a uh, in the uh, uh, in a cage-based housing uh, arena where the animals are able to um, sit in front of a touch screen and really play this this kind of task similar to a computer game where also the task can get more complicated as the monkeys learn more and more what kind of features could be relevant. You see at the bottom um, a typical monkey cage how the monkey views a touch screen. If you see it here, you see a zipper tube where the reward can be delivered or here a receptacle for pellet rewards. And you see some cameras on the top, camera windows on the top where we have always a good view of what the animals are doing. And um, this uh, kiosk station for monkeys, we developed at Vanderbilt to really allow to test monkeys more often and to also provide them a kind of enrichment structure. They really like to perform in these uh, touchscreen um, kiosk stations. You see here on the right side uh, four example monkeys, uh, uh, each rather concentrated. For example, monkey Igor, here he sits there, holds the hand at the zipper tube uh, to yeah, collect reward when he's correctly doing something. And on the right side, you see the view of the camera B uh, that he has uh, really learned a gentle touch to select an object. So this is like a nice uh, proof of principle that um, we have like a, a nice, nice kiosk enrichment station that allows us to assess higher cognitive functions. And uh, indeed, all of our monkeys are actually very effect effectively learning to reverse and flexibly uh, reverse um, uh, reward contingency and adjust behavior. So well, while they are 90% or so correct at the end of a block when uh, nothing changes and they know which stimulus is relevant, 
Um, when we change to the reward here at trial zero, you see that the performance is uh, drops. So they're initially uh, er um, uh, making errors and then they adjust, show cognitive flexibility to reach performance again. I call, I, I mentioned that this is cognitive flexibility because their selection is based on an abstract representation of color. In this example, we have other feature dimensions and other tasks where there are other abstract dimensions that they use to make a choice. It's not just a, um, uh, um, uh, a motor reversal, for example. So this task is then basically probing uh, to probing how attentional sets are learned. So which color is important in this easier in this in this, this most easiest um, uh, situation? While they have to learn uh, which color is rewarded over blocks, making this really a, a learning of attentional set paradigm. To understand how to achieve this, um, um, the models that not only fit behavior well, but also are generally adjust adjusting very quickly uh, to what is newly rewarded and valuable in the environment are reinforcement learning models. And I, yeah, and I show, I'll turn this later, but this is the one that really fits best the behavior of the monkeys and also uh, to humans in now, I think more than six or seven studies. So what you need to achieve this goal, uh, this task and show flexibility, you need the representation of these dimensions. Uh, what kind of uh, value you predict for a specific color or motion direction or location in our task. So you need to represent um, feature specific predictions or expected values. Then you need to attend to one of these features. So you need to wait your attention or direct attention to one of the features and re re remove attention from other features, which is basically the learning of the attentional set, which you can imagine similar to a weighting. So you're weighting the color dimension more than the motion and location dimension. Um, if you are making then a choice and act on the environment based on yeah, the color that is most valuable, where you expect most reward, you either receive a reward or not uh, if you make a choice. If you receive a reward uh, and it's better than you expect it. So because you, for the first time, were correct. In the previous trial, you were incorrect. You chose the wrong stimulus. Um, you have a um, prediction error. So you get more reward than you uh, expected. And the positive prediction error is a very powerful teaching signal to learn um, uh, what object features are important in, your, in our environment. So prediction error uh, um, processes are important for this task. Finally, if you have learned um, or if you are learning uh, that you expect that you got more than expected or that you get got less than expected, you um, have an experience uh, based on what you attended and, and what you chose. So in the fourth component of these models that are needed to succeed learning these tasks, you have a forgetting parameter, a decay, a memory decay for all those values uh, of features that were not attended. You can imagine uh, that um, um, if you don't attend something, you're actually not forming a memory about it, or at least not a strong memory. So this not forming of a memory is like a constant decay of forgetting of, of, these in, of this information. So we have four components of this, um, of this simple model that allows us to sort of fit behavior, fit the cognitive flexibility behavior. And we compared many different models that is shown on the, on the left side to reproduce these learning curves that you see on the right side from two monkeys. And for those of you who are, who are more um, computationally inclined, um, interestingly, uh, the more optimal, optimal um, uh, models that are typically Bayesian models that are like as fast as possible learning what is important in our environment, they are still optimal in a theoretical sense, but they are not fitting monkey and human data when, they, when you look how they perform and how they try to infer what is most valuable in our environment. So we compared, for example, a Bayesian model, and it's much worse in predicting the choices of the monkeys. So this is the first part, the computational part. The nice, uh, part, uh, the nice aspect of computational um, information is that it now provides us with these hidden values, these hidden variables that are really needed to learn, like the prediction error or the, the expected value for a specific feature, which we don't have explicitly in our design, right? We have the, the, the colors and we have the reward, but we don't measure a prediction error directly. It's like a hidden, a latent variable that we now have access to, because these are the variables that drive the learning. 
Okay, to then understand how um, these computational principles are implemented in the brain, um, we need first to ask where are the variables represented? And a good, um, a good initial uh, uh, area to look at is the prefrontal cortex and the uh, striatum, the basal, the input structure of the basal ganglia. You see that um, uh, to understand the prefrontal cortex and its connectivity to the striatum in these complex cognitive tasks, cognitive flexibility tasks, um, we need a primate model that has those brain areas in a similar way um, uh, 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 organized as uh, humans. In blue, you see the more advanced uh, granular prefrontal cortex areas. In the macaque, you have less of them. In the rodent, you have basically infra and perilimbic cortex and the anterosingulate cortices, which have similar connectivity profiles, but uh, not um, not all the um, uh, the degree of um, uh, specifications and also the functional complexity as the macaque and the human study, uh, the uh, human prefrontal cortex. So we chose the macaque as a uh, animal model because um, it shows a functional and an anatomical homology uh, with the humans. We know that the lateral prefrontal cortex, the anterior cingulate cortex, and the ventromedial prefrontal cortex um, show topographic input. Um, to the stratum, you see this here, um, uh, suggesting that if we uh, want to understand a frontal striatal contribution to cognitive flexibility at a network level, we have to record in these brain areas too. A stratum has a lot of fast plasticity mechanisms, so the hypothesis is clearly that uh, the stratum hosts the learning principles, the learning uh, mechanisms that uh, allows us to adjust quickly to change our attention from a red color to a green color, for example. On the right side, you see that the humans and the macaques are about 20 million years uh, apart in evolutionary terms. You can go to rodents, uh, to mice or rats to study similar processes, but you are already at 80 million uh, evolutionary years uh, difference. So you should expect some possible differences there. Okay, how do we then approach measuring the representation of learning variables? Now, we are choosing the anterior singlet cortex here in this coronal section and the anterior part, uh, the dorsal anterior singlet, then the rostrolateral prefrontal cortex over here, and the striatum, uh, the caudate head, and the ventral striatum. Um, as our uh, areas of interest. And um, we are typically lowering, lower, lowering um, micro electrodes uh, close to the soma of these electrodes, uh, of these um, neurons to record um, uh, action potentials and also the local field potential uh, of the surrounding membrane activity. When we do this in these brain areas, we see we have uh, found in the task that I described so far, uh, one key new signature, um, which is uh, called a feature specific prediction error. And what this means is that if you are performing such a task and you, are, um, you now have to choose the green color that was previously not rewarded, but now it is rewarded, um, if you get a reward choosing the green color, you are now getting more reward than you expected. And to know that it was the green color and not the location or the motion direction or the yeah, or the other features of the stimulus, you need a prediction error that is informative about that specific feature that, um, uh, that uh, is reward predictive. And that's what we found here. So in this example neuron, we found that the activity was high in those trials um, where there was a positive reward prediction error only for the green colored stimulus, when the green colored stimulus was important, but not when the red, red colored stimulus became important or when the, red, or the right or the left uh, object was chosen. So it was a color or a green color specific prediction error. The firing rate was much lower if there was no prediction error anymore, yeah? if you sort of got what you expected. Meaning what you see here is a very, is, is sort of a highly sophisticated computation that indicates not only what you attended, you attended green because you chose the green stimulus in this task, but also that your, the unexpected unexpectancy signal, the reward unexpectancy signal is also linked to the attended feature. So um, this then over trials in a reversal block, you see that these feature specific prediction error signals uh, 
dissipate over, over, over time, um, uh, uh, proving that there are teaching signals. They are there when cognitive flexibility uh, um, has to be shown to adjust behavior. And where do we find these feature-specific teaching signals? We find them in all three brain areas. Uh, um, earliest in the anterior single cortex, yeah, here on the left side, about 10% of neurons um, uh, show a, a color-specific prediction error. But we also see this, uh, see the, um, these uh, prediction errors that are informative for cognitive flexibility uh, in prefrontal cortex in the anterior, in the anterior striatum. Okay, um, meaning that um, uh, to, uh, to understand what this means is that there is a very distributed code of information that would allow you to adjust flexibly to the feature that you should attend in the future. Yeah? So in the, in the example, the green color. So this was now the representation level. It was the firing rate that we, uh, that we measured so far, like the a number of spikes, the uh, amount of activity that a spike elicits uh, during the reward period where prediction errors are computed. That doesn't show us or say us how uh, the circuits um, uh, in the striatum or the single cortex are really realizing that value, uh, this, the, uh, this computation. To understand this implementation in question, we have to take recourse to more fine-grained analysis approaches and study um, how attention sets are instantiated in the network, not only represented. For this, we are measuring the local field potential to, to see here, um, which is a, a summed transmembrane uh, current um, that uh, is surrounding maybe about 1,000 neurons. Um, or more, uh, and the spiking activity of single neurons. If we are doing this, we are observing rhythmic activities, oscillatory activities in the task that we discussed so far, where he, the monkey has to, cho uh, to choose to attend the red or the green stimulus. During this attentional period, there's no eye movement here. Yeah? It's just an attentional state. We see that as soon as a color is switched on, as the reward relevant cue is switched on, we see that uh, at 40 hertz, there are these bursts of, uh, of oscillations. Yeah. And they happen, they are brief bursts, and they happen at specific phases of a slower frequency oscillation. Here at the top, you see a 7 hertz local field potential oscillation. Yeah. And uh, interestingly, these uh, beta bursts, uh, sorry, the gamma bursts at 40 hertz, um, they happen here at the trough. This one is also happening at the trough. This one is happening at the trough. Uh, after the cue appears, and then sort of it wanes away a little bit. It said this kind of signature, when we saw this, we thought uh, maybe this is uh, uh, the neuronal signature that actually realizes um, the activation of the attention set. So if you, we see this cross-frequency correlation, that the gamma bursts occur now at the phases of the slow-frequency theta band modulation, maybe that is in indicating uh, that the monkey is correctly switching attention to the relevant valuables color. And uh, indeed, that's what, what, what we found. So um, first, um, we, so we found that the theta phases to which these gamma bursts locked were predominantly originating in the singlet cortex. So a, there's a medial prefrontal uh, low frequency oscillation that is reset when an attention cue, in this case, the color is switched on and it's uh, prominent in the anterior single cortex. While these gamma bursts were, were more likely observed in the lateral prefrontal cortex, lateral PFC. Maybe they are like realizing or uh, reflecting a local circuit computation that is going on. Indeed, if we, uh, uh, if we checked whether these cross frequency correlations uh, indicated correct or erroneous attention shifts, we found that on correct trials, so when attention was shifted to the correct stimulus, the phase of these gamma bursts to the low frequency oscillations was a bit later than on error trials, which is a really interesting finding because if you are modeling biophysically these networks shown here on the left side, you can, uh, you can uh, have interactions between excitatory and inhibitory neurons in a recurrent net, network that really reflects a generic neocortical um, uh, network, you can you observe uh, theta band modulations for different reasons, membrane currents, H current, for, uh, especially of, of some neurons, um, 
and um, uh, there are activity bouts, gamma bouts, uh, phase locked uh, to the theta band, to the slow frequency oscillations. At one phase, if there is a little drive, little excitatory drive, but if, yeah, this error is here big now, is thick, if the drive is increased, the phase at which the gamma bursts occur is, is shifts. Yeah, suggesting that whenever you see like a simple signature, like a, a, a phase shift of cross frequency coupling, this could indicate a, um, a, a different level of excitability in the brain network. So it's like a, a, a simple circuit level uh, um, mechanism and a new hypothesis that maybe the cingular cortex and the lateral prefrontal cortex needs sufficient excitation to realize correct attention shifts. Yeah, it's an inter-aerial signature between brain area signature of correct attention shifts. It's very rare that you find this at this kind of fine-grained level immediately after a color cue onset in the monkey. But if you then read through the literature, you find astonishing, uh, astonishing uh, insights at, uh, in, the, in, in mouse optogenetic studies. So where, um, where uh, um, these theta phase resets occur in the uh, medial prefrontal cortex, so in infra and perilimbic cortices, uh, to condition stimuli in a Pavlovian fear conditioning environment, when these condition stimuli are learned, yeah, so, um, and this is a causal mechanism. They show that this is causally important if they optogenetically uh, activate uh, the, med uh, in this case, the amygdala, uh, uh, then the spike output of the amygdala to the uh, prefrontal cortex uh, shows a couple of uh, oscillatory waves at, at the theta band. Yeah, and uh, the pyramidal cell spiking is aligned to the uh, two specific phases of this band. Um, suggesting very similar to our monkey results during the attention cue that if a conditioned cue, a conditioned stimulus is uh, learned, it also um, um, uh, triggers a local phase reset. It reactivates by phase resetting ongoing uh, activity in the theta band. And what we then observe is that, uh, that other brain areas like the lateral prefrontal cortex uh, fires gamma bursts to that low frequency oscillation. Okay, that was like um, one uh, um, activity signature that is directly, directly linked to how well we are flexibly attending a valuable stimulus. The interaerial theta to gamma correlation between anterior single cortex and prefrontal cortex. And we actually uh, reproduce this in a, in a new data set. So this is something that is that we are quite uh, interested to really understand in more detail which cell types are important, you know, where does it come from, how fast does it evolve, how much does it explain in, in behavior, because these tasks are still very simple. Okay, then if this was now the second, uh, so the first uh, um, oscillatory circuit motif, a theta gamma correlation motif, let's see whether there are other oscillations that are also playing a role. And for many people, in, uh, especially in psychiatry and in neurology, the beta frequency oscillation is maybe one of the most prominent ones that many observe. So we looked at this kind of oscillation um, uh, too in our monkeys because it's prominent in the frontal system. To understand that, we first observed that um, the spiking activity of neurons changes its characteristic when attention is shifted. So again, we have the same task, yeah, attention is, uh, the, the, the features are switched on red and, and green here during the feature selection period. What we observe is that during this period when the monkey has to shift attention and sustain attention, uh, neurons fire um, more likely bursts instead of singlet, uh, singleton spikes. So bursts in the spike domain are defined by at least the bursts that we investigate by um, having inter-spike intervals of less than five milliseconds. They're quite well uh, investigated, but they're depending on a calcium plateau, uh, maybe a back propagating uh, spike is involved. Yeah, so these, these burst uh, events are more likely when yeah, the color is switched on. They're indexing attention, the attentional state, uh, which is like an amazing finding uh, that we have now a kind of 
spike specific correlate of attention, not only a cell type specific, but a spike spiking specific one. Now, these spikes, as you see on the right side here, they are uh, frequently synchronized to the oscillatory activity of the local population. So these bursts that are here marked in red, they're all happening at the trough of this uh, gamma band oscillation that I indicate here. This is a real, real example that we, that we measured. So uh, to understand whether these bursts then again are linked to oscillatory activity, we can uh, measure the spike triggered local field potential whenever these bursts occur. Here's a single spike and the LFP around it at trial one, trial two, trial, trial three, and on average. And here's a burst, a burst triggered local field potential with, where there are two spikes. And when these two spikes occur, then you have a stronger spike triggered average. Yeah, as if these burst spikes are sort of have specific relationships with the local field potential or with the network activity. Now we can measure how much these bursts synchronize to phases of the oscillation. And we observed a very reliable, systematic, but complex pattern. It's like this. I tried to, con to, to summarize the key point. Some, some of these neurons fire a burst that synchronize, synchronize at beta frequencies. You see it here between 15 and 30 hertz. They have a peak in the beta band while the spikes that are not burst spikes, the singleton ones, don't synchronize. Other examples are, uh, show uh, a synchronization of burst to a theta band, like a 7 to 10 hertz band, and to a broad gamma band, 50 to 70 hertz, so fast oscillations, slow oscillations. That is quite a complicated pattern, because we have now two different populations of neurons. Some are beta rhythmic, others are gamma rhythmic. Like if we now separate in a pseudograph um, where these um, beta and gamma burst synchronies happen in the network, we see that they happen uh, really interarially. So they connect uh, functionally different brain areas. Shown here that area ACC uh, 24, so an anterior single cortex brain area 24, is connecting or synchronizing their, their burst spikes to the lateral prefrontal cortex in lateral uh, area 46, for example, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. Now, which is, um, so for, for someone in the neuroscience field where I'm researching in now for like more than 15 years or so now, like this is a very unique finding, like a cell, like a cell specific, frequency specific, inter-aerial um, uh, synchronization pattern. It's very difficult to find these cells but we had enough to make a reliable statistics to really see that there are segregated network. One network is beta synchronized, another network is gamma synchronized. The blue one that I show here, that was a beta synchronized network, but we also have one a gamma synchronized network, which looks a little bit different. Okay, so now, now you may ask, what is he talking about? That's all too complicated to really be functionally important or, uh, or uh, relevant. And I would argue strongly against that, because if we start with anatomy, we see a highly heterogeneous um, inter connectivity pattern. For connections that go from the anterior singlet cortex to the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, we know that, yeah, the majority of these connections, 65%, are going to pyramidal cells. They are like maybe driving yeah, the prefrontal cortex. But we know from a very nice uh, anatomical work from the Barbers lab, that um, uh, about 35 of the connections from the single cortex are controlling different types of inhibition in prefrontal cortex. Some are controlling uh, PV plus inhibition, so fast spiking inhibition, and other uh, connections control more the local tone, the background inhibition, maybe the, the dendritic tone of the inhibitory activity in prefrontal cortex. So there's a highly heterogeneous time scale of these connections and they might relate to different frequencies. Um, to understand, so now I have to check the timing. Now, I, um, if that makes sense, shall I, if there are any questions, I'm not sure. Uh, Ariel, if you see any questions, maybe we can make a break because uh, now I do like two, three more complex uh, uh, slides and then a wrap up. The questions relate to something earlier. Go ahead and we'll cover them at the end. Okay, super. Okay, then at this stage, we sort of see how, uh, how heterogeneous the anatomical connections are. But can we say a little bit about um, uh, the, 
the principles that uh, govern beta rhythmic um, uh, oscillatory states in this network. And to answer the, this question, we sort of um, took recourse to identify pyramidal cells separate from interneurons. And we can do this in the primate pretty well, um, at least in, in a statistical way, by distinguishing the action potential waveform width. So if they have the norm normalized voltage here, the action potentials of neurons, extracellular recorded, you see that some of these neurons have very narrow spikes or action potentials, other have broad spikes. And um, the majority of the broad spiking neurons uh, that show these blue action potentials, they are putative pyramidal cells. Now, there is a hypothesis that, uh, that beta activity is primarily driven by and also um, uh, um, resonates uh, or resonates most strongly with pyramidal cell activity. So then the question is, if we can distinguish the blue neurons, the broad spiking putative pyramidal cells, do they actually precede the beta bursts, which is uh, here shown on the uh, in, at, at part two, which was indicate which would indicate that the beta oscillations that we observe might follow these bursts. Or uh, on, uh, as, as an option three, maybe the burst activity is just following the network activity. Maybe there is beta oscillation in the network and then the burst occurs. Yeah. Or the more, more boring um, uh, prediction is that both occur at the same time, that whenever you see beta oscillatory states in the network, that these neurons are firing bursts because that would yeah, reflect how activity um, arrives at them. And uh, interestingly, uh, doing statistics um, on, uh, on, a, on a very good data set uh, allowed us to identify that we observe the bursting of these neurons that synchronize after, shortly after the peak synchrony in the network. So as if the pyramidal cells fire bursts whenever 50 milliseconds beforehand, there is a kind of beta burst synchronized in the network. There, that is uh, then um, inducing bursting activity of single cells. You may ask, uh, how does that now relate to specific mechanisms? Or does that help us to understand the implementational level of cognitive flexibility? And it might help us very well, because there's a very prominent theory out there uh, from uh, Matthew Lacombe that suggests that um, layer five pyramidal cells do fire bursts, like indicated here, with a, yeah, a layer five pyramidal cell, do fire bursts whenever there is coincident activity in, at the dendritic tree to give you a give rise of a plateau potential, a calcium plateau potential, and feed forward uh, type input that drives a little bit the cell and then triggers and can interact with the calcium plateau to um, elicit a back propagating spike. So it's this period of coincident activity that uh, drives bursting activity, suggesting that if that is a mechanism that is driving our effect, then the burst synchrony of single pyramidal cells might reflect the integration of feedback information from other brain areas, from the hippocampus, for about memory, about yeah, uh, from from other sources uh, with. Um, uh, with ongoing uh, 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 driving feed forward activity in prefrontal cortex. So it's, it's a highly specific uh, uh, signature that we see, and it's related to the attentional state, to the period where we shift our attention, where monkeys are successful in showing cognitive flexibility. So this is uh, admittedly quite a complex uh, final set of analysis and studies because uh, I, yeah, we didn't go into the details, but I hope that the main point um, that I wanted to convey is clear. There are complex circuit motifs giving rise to theta and beta oscillations and also synchrony of different brain networks. And this network level synchrony predicts behavior and attention very well. And um, it relates indirectly to um, how the, the variables that need to be coordinated and synchronized are represented, which was the previous section of the talk. Okay, so having said that, so we have now, I'll go back now. So we, having, we, ha we have now a good computational model that gives us the reward prediction errors and the values, the expected values of our, our stimuli in our environment. 
we know where they are represented, these, or these, these variables, or that they are distributed. And we have some uh, good ideas on how they're implemented at the cell level and the, um, uh, at the cellular level primarily. So then the next question that, I, that we are currently working on is to understand more the synaptic mechanisms, mechanism, because um, we know from rich literature from Arnston and, other, and others that uh, uh, there are uh, connections between neurons um, made by uh, long spines in the prefrontal cortex, for example, in the basal dendrite. Here's a basal dendrite, some spines there. They have a long neck, you see it here. So this is a, a connection of, this is a postsynaptic neuron spine that uh, connects to a presynaptic neuron here. It's, uh, it's this, uh, the synapse, for example, could be a synapse between prefrontal cortex and the anterior cingulate cortex. It yeah, could be one of these. And we know that these spines um, are common pathways or common final bottlenecks for efficient neuronal communication. So if a neuron is activated, it has to go through these spines. So they're sending information there. And um, you see different, uh, different types of uh, receptors and uh, neuromodulatory mechanisms uh, that make this uh, connection from a presynaptic neuron to the prefrontal cortex neurons more or less if effective. Yeah, uh, and we see immediately that there is a no, no adrenergic receptor, uh, the alpha two A, a nicotinic one, there are glutam glutamate or NMDA receptors, um, and many different types of um, ion channels, which could all influence how efficient these networks are synchronizing. And we sort of, just as one example, one earlier study of us for, in our group uh, showed that uh, with guanfacine, for example, we are, can boost alpha 2A no adrenergic receptor activity. And indeed, we, this not only boosts the network activity, but it actually improves flexibility of monkeys. And we are hoping uh, that uh, in the Vanderbilt context, we can leverage uh, the uh, the setup, the, the neurocomputational framework that we developed uh, to understand these other receptors um, and how they influence cognitive flexibility uh, uh, in more detail um, using our kiosk station where the monkeys play these computer games flexibly in their cages. Okay, that was the last slide. Uh, that was uh, quite a lot, but I hope well, well organized. Um, I thank you for listening. I thank uh, um, the graduate students and postdocs in the lab, and also the collaborators, uh, Paul Tiesinger in particular, for helping with the computational work. Okay, thank you so much for, for listening, and I hope um, some of this uh, could resonate with you. Thank you. We do have one question. Well, we actually have more than one question from Dr. Brennan. Uh, so let me, let me give you his first two let you answer those and then we'll move on. So number one, does the type of reward matter? Can it be removal of an aversive stimulus instead of or in lieu of a provision for a pleasant stimulus? That's an amazing question. Um, we are currently working on exactly that question. So um, we know that behaviorally, it makes actually quite a difference um, to remove a stimulus. Uh, for example, to really, um, uh, uh, prevent them from getting a reward or from taking away a reward. How are we doing this in the monkeys? Um, we are using a token task. Instead of giving them reward or giving them a punishment, which many people do, we give them actually visual tokens. Uh, they get like a couple of green tokens when they are correct. And sometimes we can subtract one. We take, yeah, we take one away. So they have a loss uh, um, uh, experience. And thereby we can distinguish whether gain or loss uh, dis differently influences these behaviors. We haven't the neuro, we do not have neurophysiological data. I think that has not been done in the monkey at least. It's not known um, uh, how this is realized in the brain. Well, we, we expect that like it's an active aversion, uh, aversion process that is um, there. Maybe we need to record in the lateral habernula instead of the stratum. Maybe we have more amygdala inputs uh, to to override this. We know that, you know this probably better, like we know that um, in the ventral striatum, you have dopamine signals to aversive stimulus, stimuli. You know that Erin Calipari is here at Vanderbilt studying that uh, the saliency as opposed to just the valence of output, how this influences attention. So these are hot topics. We haven't a good answer to your question, but we are on it. Uh, 
let's see, I have, I have a question. We're, we're in academics and academicians have a kind of, they're very talented at focus. So attending and not attending to distracting stimuli. You're really talking in many ways about attentional allocation, prioritizing the salience, if you will, of the incoming stimuli so that one can direct. Are the processes different for a focused attention? Um, uh, yes, they are different. They are partly different. Um, and interestingly, um, Ariel, it's interesting that you ask this. We can actually dissociate them in the, with the acetylcholine system. So the cholinergic modulation that we do um, would affect how focused attention is. For example, when you have many distractors, how good are you attending? Uh, the cholinergic system, particularly the prefrontal cortex, is important to remove distraction and allow you to focus, to filter out irrelevant stuff, irrelevant information, and uh, focus on the relevant one. And we can see that we can boost this with, um, with, um, with donepezil or with other cholinergic uh, agonists. So this is the focusing aspect that is more realized in prefrontal cortex. The, um, the uh, attentional goal setting that I'm talking about, the attentional sets, um, they are generated through, probably through plasticity mechanisms in the striatum and the cingulate cortex that I conveyed. And, um, and they are using a different uh, receptor system. So with acetylcholine, we don't see an improvement in, in flexible learning, but we see an improvement in distractor filtering in the visual search domain. So it feels like we, we have almost like a double dissociation that some people in the human field also report that the focusing is more prefrontal cortex uh, heavy process while the goal setting and the flexible change in, in goals um, and an overriding uh, previous biases, behavioral biases is more a stridal uh, process. Thank you for the question. I think this is, yeah, this is a uh, another Another question, you, you talked about Larkum and the coincident signaling at L5 and in apical tufts. So you're almost, by definition, invoking heterogeneity then in, in across layers. Have you looked at that, or alternatively, across the pyramidal cells that are projecting to different targets? Yeah, no, we have. Yeah, it's a great question. Honestly, we have not looked at this, but um, we are using laminar recording probes now in order to start. Um, tracing these the, the, this in, in, in finer gra in fi at finer scale. It also should be said that the, we don't really know whether what we see is only layer five cells, it could be layer three cells, or and these the bursting, the calcium dependent bursting is a little bit dependent on how long the dendritic trees are. So yeah. so it's 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 a hypothesis that we still maybe first need to solid solidify more and uh, connect to the in vitro people uh, better to really start understanding this, but your question is uh, right in the right in the center of what needs to be answered to really know this better. Yes. Thank you. So a, a final question really asking you to jump out very far. Do you see a way of exploiting this, the types of data that you, you've gathered here from tracking, translating to the human condition and making diagnostic yeah, we are actually. Yeah, gonna, yeah so we, we we hope we hope to do this uh, to help a little bit in uh, uh, um, in with the drug discovery team at Vanderbilt. We hope that we'll connect to them at one point in time and see how we uh, sort of maybe find very specific receptor muscarini, for example, receptor mechanisms to support cognitive flexibility, or we have NMDA uh, mod modification at the moment where we test uh, how good the behavioral effects are. So if we have drug drugs or, or specific subreceptor agonists or um, allosteric modulators um, that would allow us to to modify to increase or decrease activity in individual um, brain areas that's what we would like to achieve and you, you may you may have heard that we are using focus ultrasound to uh, uncage drugs locally within the brain it's an early stage of investigation but there are uh, which that's what we can do in the monkey we can try to release uh, uh, different types of drugs 
in ketamine and dopamine agonists are already uh, available uh, in experimental stages um, in brain areas to see whether we can improve the flexibility of monkeys. And as soon as that works, because the ultrasound goes through the skull, it's a transcranial, um, uh, it, there's a huge potential for this to be like a, a possible uh, future uh, um, uh, treatment strategy even. Um, especially for drugs that act like longer term, that acts more like a vaccination for against something like ketamine and, and depression or so. Yeah, I should also, I should mention one more thing if you say this, like what our core interest is at the moment is to generate a closed loop system where we leverage the bursts whenever they occur to stimulate and increase, uh, in, the, increase these bursting activities um, while they occur to see whether they have really a functional effect and because that would then prove that we have found the mechanism that makes the network um, more adaptive yeah um, so it was a very very strong mechanistical background and that is work that is ongoing and probably takes a couple of years to really uh, have the first uh, systematic good results okay, we, have one, we have one final question uh, and comment from alexandra musa Tuts. He says, I'm interested in the role of the cerebellum in learning, modeling, error detection, and model updating. Yes. What has been quite compelling to me recently are some of the rodent studies investigating cerebellar influence on cerebral nodes, such as the prefrontal, as a potential mechanism for cerebellar contributions to higher order cognitive processes. Has any of your work suggested, or to your knowledge, has anyone investigated in the primary whether the cerebellum may have a role in these circuits and cognitive processes, perhaps as an upstream process to facilitate more broadly. Yes. Um, it's, I'm, I'm not aware of, of papers showing this. I, I know that there are cognitive also in the cerebellum, cognitive domains. Um, uh, and I know that if you are prevent the cerebellum from uh, parts of the cerebellum from developing, you're getting uh, severe intellectual difficulties, which is a difficulty of flexibly processing information for your cognition. So working memory deficits. Uh, I think there are the first working memory studies out in the cerebellum, but I'm not familiar with that literature. There, there, there should be a clear contribution. Maybe it's even fine error control, like in the motor control domain for sure, right? But for cognition, I'm not sure. And these reward-based learning process in the striatum, I think they are very different to the um, Purkinje cell mossy fiber interactions in the in the cerebellum. I think that's it's a very different process in the in the striatum. Okay, we got one more question. The last question, Dr. Paul Newhouse, with aging in the human, there's evidence of reorganization of circuitry for cognitive tasks. Would this be manifest in your local or distant circuits? Has this been looked at in aging macaques? Yes, yeah, that is, um, yeah, we would love to study this, the aging in, in the animals uh, with these task, uh, types of designs. The only aging studies that I know come through the Arnsen domain, the field, at least in the prefrontal cortex. And there are some in UC Davis about uh, hippocampal inputs to the prefrontal cortex. Um, so far, what I know is they are reporting primarily firing rate differences that there is maybe less efficient inhibition, less, if, less firing rate sustained activity that would reflect the goal, a less, uh, a less strong representation of what needs to be attended. That's what I, how I read at the moment the literature, but uh, there's, I think there's not good, no good studies showing the specific subreceptor mechanisms. So there's an alpha-4, um, beta-2 nicotinic study uh, uh, about um, uh, uh, distractor filtering in the prefrontal cortex, I think from two years ago that shows, um, that suggests that in aging, um, uh, these mechanisms might, could be rebalanced by enhanced cholinergic modulation. But I, I think you know this much better than I do. Um, so there are very few people studying this in aging and we failed like two times now with grants uh, because we don't have aging animals. Uh, we, cannot, uh, we cannot get convincing funding for this without, without that. Thank you very much for your help and contribution. We've learned a lot. And thank you to the participants. Okay, thank you so much for, for your attention and, and patience in trying to pass all this. Thank you. Okay.
people are going out. Thank you, Tilo. You know, we ought to get Amy to come down, Arnston. Oh yeah, that would be nice. Was she here already? What? what? Was she here once? You know, I don't remember. She was here once, but that was uh, quite a while ago. Uh, and I haven't seen her. In, I saw her two years ago at a, a drug thing, but I haven't seen her in a long time. It'd be fun to get her down, particularly when, yeah. when we're dealing with 